Praise the Lord. So I want to share with you today about the day of Pentecost. Okay. We're coming up to Pentecost Sunday next Sunday. And I want to share with you about the day of Pentecost or the Feast of Pentecost a little bit. I want to give you some background to it from the Old Testament and then and then bring us into the new just to see something of what this Pentecostal experience is all about. Not the denomination Pentecostal, by the way. Don't start thinking that. But just the experience of the Feast of Pentecost. Amen. And what that means for us. Because it's such a glorious, wonderful, empowering feast. It's a God wants to meet with us at Pentecost. In fact, for those of you who are new to understanding the feasts, there were three major feasts in the in the Hebrew calendar that God set in place. Okay, these are not just Jewish feasts. These were feasts that that God, that Yahweh Himself, uh, established as meeting times or appointed times to meet with his people amen they were appointments every year and so three times a year the the people of god were to meet with god in jerusalem for these important meeting times and they they were called passover the feast of passover the second feast was the feast of pentecost that we're going to talk about a bit more today and the third feast was the feast of tabernacles and the the feast of passover was in the first month the Feast of Pentecost was in the third month and the Feast of Tabernacles was in the seventh month. And, and so these feasts were important times where God's people would come and meet with God and God would meet with them and, and release, and it was to release something in them. Amen. So God wanted to meet with them so that the, the experience of meeting with him there would stay with them forever. Amen. And, and so these feasts that were literally kept like in a physical way uh, in the old covenant have a fulfillment in Christ and in the new covenant. They, they, they are fulfilled not by us doing the physical chores and rituals of those feasts, but they're fulfilled in us experiencing what those feasts were always pointing to. Amen. So the law of the Old Testament scriptures points us, it's a tutor, which is to bring us to Christ. Amen. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and 4, that the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. And so part of the law was the feasts and how to keep them. And so these are all things that are meant to bring us to Christ. So coming back just to get us in the context, the, the feast of Passover, awesome feast, the first Passover was held in Egypt. And uh and around the Passover time this year, we were sharing this quite a bit and about how in, the, how in Egypt, the people of Israel were in Egypt and they were to be set free from slavery out of Egypt. God raised up Moses as a deliverer. And, and then the final thing he did was he said, now get a lamb and you're to slaughter that lamb and you're to put the blood of that lamb on the doorposts and the lintels of the house. This is all in Exodus chapter 12. And then Yahweh will come through it in the midnight time and he will pass over every house that has the blood and you'll be saved. The firstborn sons of that household will be saved. But anything that doesn't, anyone that doesn't have the blood on their house will be, the firstborn sons will be destroyed. They'll be killed. And so that's all an awesome picture. So that was all pointing us to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God whose blood, if we believe in it, is applied to our life, and so Yahweh passes over us. We are saved from destruction. So wonderful. Amen. Amen. And, and Passover was also then part of Passover was that then the children of Israel had to leave Egypt. For us, Egypt becomes a picture of the world. Pharaoh is a bit of a picture of the devil, you know, keeping us in bondage, trying to keep us in bondage and slavery to sin. And But God breaks his power through the blood of the Lamb. But then the children of Israel, got to, they had to go through the Red Sea. And in, in 1 Corinthians, and I'm just saying these things, you can get it on the recording as well, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul calls that their baptism, that they were baptized into Moses, in the cloud and in the sea. And so part of our Passover experience is to believe in the blood, to believe in the lamb that was slain for us, which is Jesus, and then to be baptized into him to get out of Egypt. And that brings us into a whole new life. But then we need to come to another 
place. And in Exodus chapter 19, and I'll get you to look at this, in Exodus chapter 19, in verse 1, you'll see that after they came out of Egypt, after they came through the Red Sea, they then got brought to a place uh, which was the next major experience, if you like, the next major encounter with God that was to change their lives forever. And, and so it says in Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, in the third month, what month? The third third month. month. Now, I'm not going to go to these verses, but if you want to check out the feast, look at Leviticus chapter 23, great chapter that deal, that sort of brings out all those three feast times. But the day of Pentecost was 50 days after Passover was complete, if you like, after the day of first fruits, which was part of Passover. Okay. Now, the day of first fruits in the Passover feast was actually, and they, they were, what they would do, they would get the first ripe heads of the grain, which was normally the barley harvest at that time. They'd get the first ripe heads of grain of barley. They'd get a sheaf of that first ripe. Uh, head, and they would have a sheaf that they would wave as a wave offering before Yahweh, and that was their first fruit offering, and that was all part of the Passover time. And that that wave offering of the first fruits as part of Passover was fulfilled in Christ rising from the dead and becoming the first fruits of them who would rise from the dead. Hallelujah. And then for seven weeks after. First fruits, there would be seven weeks of harvest time where they're bringing in the harvest for seven weeks. And at this, after seven weeks, generally that feast, the, the, the harvest would be all brought in and then would be the celebration of Pentecost. Hallelujah. So then Pentecost would be celebrated at the end of that harvest season with all the harvest brought in. Hallelujah. For those of you who know a little bit, did you know that the in the in the sort of Hebrew or Jewish tradition, the story that they would always share at Pentecost was the story of Ruth. They would always read the book of Ruth. Why? Because that's a story of Passover to Pentecost. It's a story of going through the barley harvest. Amen. And Ruth was in, in part of that harvest. And then the final thing at the end of the harvest was what? A marriage. A covenant. Hallelujah, between Ruth and Boaz, Boaz being in the lineage of the Messiah, being in the lineage of Judah, the kings, and finally the Messiah, Jesus himself, came from that lineage. So for those of you who know the story of Ruth, a beautiful story, but more than a beautiful story, it's a picture of coming into that marriage covenant, which happens at the time of Pentecost. Okay, very interesting. Because here in Exodus chapter 19, it says in the third month, in Exodus 19 verse 1, after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So where did they come to in the third month? They came to Mount Sinai. Hallelujah. And verse 3. Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel. And look at this beautiful thing. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So this was where, at Mount Sinai, this was where the people of God would finally come into covenant with God. Interesting to realize that they didn't come into covenant at Passover. They were saved. They were redeemed. That means they were purchased at Passover even brought through the Red Sea, brought through baptism, but then they were brought to this mountain where the covenant would be sealed, would be ratified, would be put in place. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Because this is where the covenant vows would be made. Amen. So they believed and they were saved. But it's interesting here, if you like, being saved doesn't necessarily mean you've entered the covenant. Amen. Because we've got to agree to it. We've got to, and, and by the way, the new covenant is so easy to agree with. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because it's such a wonderful covenant. Amen. But here, here at the old covenant, they came to Mount Sinai, and 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 now this awesome thing begins to take place. God's going to meet with them at Mount Sinai, and there's going to be an amazing encounter between God and his people, but it's going to happen through Moses. Okay. Now, finally, so Moses goes up and have a look, you know, just some, some things about this time in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 16. It says, then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings. Everyone say thunderings, lightnings. Yeah. Wow, this is powerful, man. So there's, and it says, and there's a thick cloud on the mountain. So imagine it's a thick cloud on the mountain. There's thundering, there's lightning going on. This is powerful manifestations. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. And all the people who were in the camp, go for it, Arthur. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah my sound effect man hallelujah so here we got the sound of the trumpet that's very loud all the and so this was scary this was for the people of god they were so scared they was they just ended up saying moses you go up we're not going near this thing we're not going near this mountain you just go up and talk for us and you tell us what god said as for us we're we're we're, we're fine with you you just go so it was, it was full on. It was scary. It was powerful. Awesome manifestations of God's power and glory. And so it says that at the end of verse 20, then Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Hallelujah. Moses went up. And for us, who went up? Jesus went up. Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. After he died on the cross and rose again, 40 days later, then he ascended. He went up. Amen. He went up and he sat on the mercy seat in heaven. He went into the presence of God for us. He put his blood on the mercy seat. Hallelujah. So now we can also access the very presence of God. And in this instance, Moses went up. And what did Moses, what did God give Moses when he was up there? He gave him. Ten commandments on tablets of stone. And these commandments became the basis of the covenant. Amen. They became the foundation of the covenant. You need, you need to keep these commands. You know, the Ten Commandments are the foundation for all the other things, all the other commands you read about in the Torah find their basis in these ten. And in these ten commandments, you know, we've just been teaching all these RI kids about the Ten Commandments recently, and it's been so good. And, you know, as we've been teaching these Ten Commandments, guess what God's been doing? He's been convicting us. <laughs> you know, the law, it's so, it's so awesome yeah. because the law really gets to the heart of human beings. Yeah. Amen. Those Ten Commandments, they really nail the heart of human beings because mm. from there everything else that we do as well, little minor detail type of things, find their basis in these commands. And uh, let me just go through these laws. So the first one is, you shall not worship any other gods before me. Pretty simple, but how easy is it for human beings to worship something else? <laughs> to worship a god of our choosing, to worship something that we like, hey? something that allows us to get away with whatever we want, something that whatever it is, we want to worship our own god. And so we worship it. We can worship, decide to worship anything. But God says, don't worship any God except me. Number two, don't make an idol. Don't make anything that looks like anything in the heaven or on the earth or beneath the earth or that's in the waters and make that and, and bow down to it. Don't do that. And yet how much do human beings want to make something that they like to worship or have something that's already created and worship that thing? How many people worship the earth? 
They worship the land or they worship creatures on the land or they worship people, other human beings, either famous ones that have died and, and, and gone on or they worship celebrities, sports stars, whoever it is. Amen. You know, I used to think Michael Jordan was so cool until I realized he committed adultery. And then I realized, hey, Michael Jordan's not cool. He can throw a basket. He can throw a ball into a basket really well, but his private life is a bit messed up. All those sort of things. Suddenly my idol came crashing down. And praise God for that. Amen. Let the idols fall. Let them totter. Amen. So God said, don't bow down to any idols. Number three, he said, don't take my name in vain. That doesn't, that, that, you know, that means saying Jesus Christ in a bad way, which heaps of people do. But it goes deeper than that. It means don't, don't say you're a follower of Jesus if you're not serious about it. If you want to keep the reputation of his name. You don't want to say, I'm a, I'm a believer and then go get, you know, go get crazy drunk in the pub and start, you know, doing all silly stuff or whatever it might be. Amen. In other words, don't carry his name in vain. Seek to uphold his name. Seek to keep a good reputation for his name in your life. Uh, another person once said too, it's also, you ever heard these people who say, God told me. You know, God told them all these funny sorts of things. But don't measure up with the word of God. What's that doing? Taking his name in vain. Trying to put his stamp on your sin or on, on your idea or your imagination. Amen. Don't do that. Hallelujah. Be very careful when you're saying, thus says the Lord. Amen. Be, be, be assured in your heart that he's really saying that. Amen. Or at least word it in a way where you're, you're giving a little bit of room that uh, it could be me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the fourth one, keep the Sabbath holy, a day of rest. Work six days, have one off. Amen. And, uh, and we learn in the new covenant that that Sabbath rest is actually a rest in Christ. Amen. It's, it's a rest of faith in Christ. Not a particular day, although in our society, Sundays has become a fairly good day to, to, to not do your normal work and just worship the Lord. But guess what? It's not restricted to one day either. You, we're to worship God every day. We're to hang out in him. Mm. Amen. But we're to keep a day free for him. And we find out as well, if you go deeper into that, that there's an eternal day that we enter into by faith. Hallelujah. So all those first four, they come under the category of love God. So the first four commandments are all about how to love God. It's got to do with your relationship with God. The second six commandments have got to do with your relationship with other human beings. In other words, love, love, learning how to love your neighbor. So that's why Jesus said that the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God, love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second, love your neighbor as yourself, because on these hang all the law and the prophets. And the Ten Commandments are the best picture of that. The first four commandments are how do you love God. The second six are how you love your neighbor. Number one, honor your father and your mother. That's a foundation for many things. You'll find that if you have got an issue with your dad or your mum, guess what? You'll probably have issues with lots of other people too. You'll have issues with authority. You know, you'll have issues with the police or you'll have issues with your boss at work. You'll have issues with anybody who's over you in some capacity. Why? Because you never honoured your father. And if you didn't honour your father, then you tend to be a little bit uppity with anybody who's in authority because that's the first place that you learn authority. And you might say, well, my father doesn't deserve to be honoured. He was a bad guy. He beat us up or he abused us or whatever it is. And and that's real. And that's a, that's a difficult situation. It's not easy to honour people when they've done bad things. But God didn't say honour them if they're good. He just said honour is another word for respect. Amen. And it's also when you honour somebody, you don't expose them in a shameful way. Amen. You're real about things, but you don't expose them in a shameful way. Amen. And so this can be a difficult thing, but if you get it right, 
even if there have been difficult things and you you and you might have needed to get out of there in your life and that might have been necessary but in your heart god wants to bring you to a place where you can at least honor them because they actually are your father and your mother you came into the world through them amen and god chose that no matter what the situation and if you break into a place where you can just even honor them and begin to honor them in that way you know what you're going to experience a freedom in your heart that's going to overflow into many other relationships amen even honoring them because god made them if that's all you can do is say i honor them because god created them in his image and likeness and even though they messed up real bad i honor them as a creation of god amen hallelujah so do you see how these commandments become a basis for so many other things? So then it says, do not murder. Is that the next one? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, let me just check. Yeah, you shall not murder. And Jesus brought that one to a whole nother level, didn't he? He said, if you hate somebody in your heart, you've already murdered them, even though you might not have physically done it. So Jesus brought it into the heart issue realm. Amen. So we're not, God's very big on not allowing hate to lodge in our heart. If you find that you're hating somebody and you've got a strong animosity towards them, you've got to deal with that. Yeah. With God and say, God, help me. Amen. Because that thing will end up destroying you. If you can be free of the hate of that murderous spirit, you'll be set free. Amen. In many areas, you'll be able to relate with everybody out of a right heart. What's the next one? You shall not commit adultery. So this, again, the marriage relationship, very important before God. Faithfulness is important before God. And that if we do that, do you think that will overflow into being faithful in all sorts of relationships? That we'll be a committed, loyal person in our friendships, in other relationships with people, if we're faithful in the marriage relationship as well? Hallelujah. Where we're, and guess what? Even this command comes into, into our relationship with God also because it's a marriage covenant that we're entered into with God. And so faithfulness has got to do with also not worshipping any other God, that we're, gonna, that, we're, that we're like that with God in our relationship. Amen? That we become a faithful person, a loyal person. Hallelujah. Do, do you see how these, command, these commandments, man, they hit you. They hit at the human heart. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you feel anything inside of you kicking up at any of these already, know that it's not me, it's God. And God's just wanting to help you to uh, humble down and ask him for help. Amen. Amen. If it's bringing up anything in your life. Mm -hmm. You shall not steal. Amen. Don't take what doesn't belong to you. Be honest. Amen. Even with your, you know, your tax return. Make sure you're not stealing from the government. Make sure you declare. Everything. <laughs> but they don't deserve it. They're always up to it. Yeah, just don't steal. <laughs> Hallelujah. Or whatever it is. Might have been that little pencil that you loved when you were a kid. You know? And oh, you, really? Yeah, that little pencil, Arthur. You know, it was very tempting, wasn't it? You just wanted to take it from Susie, who was sitting next to you in the class. Yeah. So it all starts there. <laughs> whatever it is. And you got to give it back, or if you can, and and you know the Bible says if you have stolen something, when you do give it back, you need to give it back fourfold. Well, not fourfold. Um, add, adding a fifth to it. Sorry, that's a little bit. Zacchaeus did it fourfold. He went over the top, in a good way though. But you don't have to do that. The law said add twenty percent to it. Amen. So if you took a pencil, you got to give your pencil plus the one you've used down that far. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a little joke. All right. Then uh, the ninth one is you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is huge. Don't tell lies about other people just because you don't like them. Oh, man, this is a huge one. How many people bad mouth other people behind their back and give a false testimony of them? I mean, we experience this as a ministry big time. And it's a basis for witchcraft, people spreading rumours, telling false things, saying that we're like this or like that when they have no idea what we're like. They're bearing a false 
testimony. And it causes people to then be discouraged to come near us. And it's all based on a falsehood. It's all based on a lie. And that's one of the big ways the devil works. Amen. And so there's a, God, God hits it. Don't try to get back at people by spreading bad things about them that are not true. Amen. And then finally, don't covet what belongs to your neighbor. Covetousness, huge problem. I just want more. If I could just get more, the grass is greener on the other side. But guess what? You get that grass and then you look back over at the side you had before and you think, oh, now that's greener. Because when you're, when you're covetous, it's never enough. You get what you thought you wanted and you might have done it at the expense of somebody else because that's what covetousness do. You don't care about anybody else anymore. You just want that thing. And you think if I get that thing, my life will be fulfilled. I'll feel so satisfied. And then you get it and you realize, no, I need more. I need a bigger thing. I need more of it. I, I still don't have enough. And you think if you get more of it, you'll be fulfilled. It's a horrible disease, that covetousness. And what's the, what's the antidote? Be content with what you have and thank God for it. Do you know what an antidote for covetousness is? Thanking God for everything you have. Thank God for your husband and your wife. Thank God for the, the possessions you have. Thank God for everything. Amen. And you'll be able to diffuse covetousness. So why is all this important? Because under the old covenant, this was the covenant. This is what they agreed to. This was the law. This was it. They agreed to this. And we're entering into the covenant. This was Pentecost. The law was given on Pentecost. And so they, they received this law. Moses received it on tablets of stone. And, uh, and by the time he came down from the mountain, guess what had happened? The children of Israel, let's just go over to Exodus chapter 32 and verse 4 and 5. I'll just take about another five or ten minutes, guys, and then we'll be good. Exodus 32 verse 4 and 5 is it says that while Moses was up the mountain, the children of Israel started getting, you know, all worried that we don't know what's happened to him. He's been up there six weeks. You know, he's almost six weeks. Maybe he's dead. Maybe God killed him. Maybe he fell down a cliff. We don't know what's going on. And so then they wanted Aaron to make a God for them. And so it says that Aaron, in verse 4, he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And then they said, this is your God, O Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. He actually called that golden calf Yahweh, that, that idol. And so the children of Israel were already making an idol. So be careful. These, these were people that were purchased with the blood, gone through baptism, but now they're, they're falling away already. They're getting discouraged, impatient, and deciding we're going to worship something else. Moses comes down. He's so angry, he breaks the stone tablets when he sees what's going on. And then in Exodus chapter 32, verse 25, look at this. This is, this is all happening around Pentecost, brethren. This is all to understand Pentecost. This is the first Pentecost. Now when in Exodus 32, verse 25, now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, but Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on Yahweh's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Wow. And he said to them, thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. How many people fell? 3,000. 3,000 died. Now keep that in your mind. All right. Now go to Exodus chapter 34. Because this was the old covenant. All right. I've got some good news coming, okay? It's all looking scary and bleak at the moment. You might, you might not want to come to Pentecost at the moment, knowing all this. 
<laughs> but let's see how it turns around in the new. But in Exodus chapter 34, I want you to see that from verse 29, because then Moses went up the mountain and he actually spent another 40 days with God and he got another two tablets of stone and he got the Ten Commandments written on them again because he broke the first two tablets. And then it says, Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with God. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Can you imagine? The presence, it wasn't just that Moses' face was glowing. The presence of the glory of God was so thick on Moses' life, shining out of his face, that Aaron and the children of Israel were scared. They were afraid to come near Moses. They were fearful of the presence. How incredible is that? Amen. And, and then verse 34 of Exodus 34, but whenever Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he would take the veil off. So there was a veil he put on his face because of that. So that the so the people could come near him because they were scared. The glory was shining out of Moses' face in such a way that it made them fearful. And so Moses put a veil over his face so that they would not be scared to come near him. But whenever Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out and would come out and speak to the children of Israel, whatever he had been commanded. Wow. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him, with God. So now I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and just see now how the Apostle Paul brings all this into the New Testament context for us. Yep, so 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul, talking to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, says, you are our epistle. That means you are our letter. So we didn't write a letter in, on paper and ink with paper and ink. He says, you Corinthians, you are our letter. You are our epistle. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ. You're a letter of Christ. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone. Everyone say, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. See, Moses received the law on tablets of stone, and they were there as a law word that they could look at the stone and they would see the commands written. But now in the new covenant, God doesn't write his law on the stone anymore but by the spirit of the living god he puts that law in you and this is so awesome and i know many of you know this but this is so awesome and i want you to look at it in a new realm of wonder that god's law his teaching is written in your hearts and that's why now when you go to do something that might be even just slightly off there's this thing in you that's saying no stop that's not the right way. And as you learn to listen to the spirit of God within you, you'll be actually keeping the law of God. You'll be keeping the covenant. You know, the new covenant is sealed by the Holy Spirit coming inside of you. And this is what the day of Pentecost is all about. Amen. The feast of Pentecost for us in the new covenant, Moses went up and he received the law. The feast of Pentecost in the new covenant is us receiving the law in our hearts by the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling in us. By the Holy Spirit coming and being poured out in our life. Hallelujah. This yeah. is so beautiful. Hallelujah. We're living in such an amazing time of history. 
We're living in the latter days when God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. My sons and daughters will prophesy. Their old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions. On my men servants and on my maid servants in those days, I'll pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Hallelujah. What a day to be alive. Amen. We've been living in that day for 2,000 years and God is pouring out his spirit even to this day. We're in the yeah. latter days, and this is the time of the Spirit of God, William and Clinton. This is the time of getting filled with the Holy Ghost and, and having that law written in our hearts. Hallelujah, so that we can be a letter of Christ, an epistle of Christ read by all men. Hallelujah, by a transformed experience. See, the old covenant, under the old covenant, that law word is powerful and glorious and wonderful. But when it's only written on stone, it has no power to change your life. It only has the power to show you how bad you are. And that was the problem under the old covenant, was it had no power to make you perfect or transform you or make you into the image of Christ. All it did was end up showing you you're a sinner, which is necessary, which is good for us to understand but it didn't have the power to change us. It didn't have the power to transform us, but in this new covenant. And so even under that old covenant, which had no power to change us, Moses' face shone with a glory that probably none of us has really ever fully seen before. A man's face shining with the glory of God in such a way that brought heavy conviction. Now, I think some of us might have experienced something of it. Amen. Who's ever looked on somebody and said, wow, I can see Jesus in you? Amen. Yeah. But maybe not to the level of glory yet that we're, we're all hoping for. Amen. Who wants Amen. more of that glory to manifest? Who wants yeah. to walk down the streets of Warabinda and, 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 and people be tangibly feeling? And, and maybe to some extent they do, and maybe that's why they run away from you. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. And maybe, maybe some people know that when they're around you, it's uncomfortable because, because Jesus is in you and they know they can't, they can't get away with their sinfulness around you. And, and I want to share with you, yeah, that's something of the glory in you. They know. Amen. They may not be able to put it into words, but they know. They know there's something there. Amen. Hallelujah. So coming back to 2 Corinthians 3 here, have a look here in... In verse 5 and 6, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. See, what did that letter, what did that law word on stone do on the day of Pentecost way back at Mount Sinai? It ended up causing 3,000 souls to die. It ended up bringing death. So the ministry of the old covenant brought death, not because the old covenant was bad and not because the law was bad. The law was good. But because of it being so good and human beings being so bad and it had no ability to change us, it brought death because the wages of sin is death. And so that law where it brought death, the letter kills. But the spirit wow. brings life. Wow. And so on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the day the Holy Ghost fell, the day in history. Man, oh man, what a day. Hallelujah. What a day. I hope in the annals of the kingdom we can watch the video of that upper room. Amen. When that sound of a mighty rushing wind came in and when those tongues as a fire appeared on everyone's heads and they began to be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. You understand how amazing that day was in the history of the whole world and creation, that that was the first day ever in history that human beings began to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, where God himself began to live inside human beings. <laughs> And ever since that day, human beings are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, we are privileged. 
Amen. The men and women of God in the Old Testament, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and Moses, they dreamed of the day. They saw it afar off. They spoke about it. They prophesied it. They, they knew it was coming. Hallelujah. Amen. They knew it was coming, but they, but they never ended up experiencing it come. Hallelujah. Wow. Glory to God. And so on that day in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, it says that when Peter preached after being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, when Peter preached, that then it says in Acts 2, 41, that those who received the word gladly were baptized and about 3,000 souls were added. Yes. To the church. Was that, wow. 3,000 souls saved. How many died back on the first Pentecost? 3,000. How many got saved on the fulfillment Pentecost? 3,000. Do you think that's a coincidence? No. Not a coincidence. Amen. Mm -hmm. God, the new covenant came in. And so back in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, look, the Apostle Paul writes this, and we'll finish in this area. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. But if, the, but if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his yeah, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? It was glorious. Moses' face shone in such a way that, that the people of God were scared because of that glory shining out of his face. How much more will the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory because we are righteous now. We've been declared righteous. See, the old covenant could only declare us sinners. But the new covenant declares us righteous. And so if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory. This is yes, yes Mama Diane. Are you talking? <laughs> no, it's right. I just we're just getting excited. Amen. Amen. Verse 11, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. So this causes us to become very bold. Amen. This causes us to become very bold. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face. See, under the old covenant, he had to veil his face. He had to veil it so that, so that everyone could cope with it. But in the new covenant, we don't veil it. No, 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 no. We, we let it shine. Okay. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. So unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. You know why they couldn't cope with it? Because their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because it's not a physical veil, it's a spiritual veil that lies on the mind and it's only taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is Pentecost, brethren. Turning to the Lord, the veil being taken away, the Spirit of God being filled, filling us up because the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, freedom, glory, glory. And we all with unveiled face now. Say unveiled face. Unveiled face. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. You know what? When you look in the mirror now, what do you see? 
you saw do you see sinful ugly little you you know and i'm not saying you're ugly i'm saying that's how, sometimes how we see ourselves right because we think oh look at um, i know everything about you you're a horrible person da, 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 da. or do you see something different do you see the glory of the lord do you know no joke i didn't know these verses but not long after i was born again i remember a morning i'm looking in the mirror literally looking in the mirror and as I just looked at myself, I saw Jesus. And I and I was a little bit freaked out thinking, oh, dear, you know, that's not good because, you know, people will think I'm crazy. But then I realized, no, because I start, I was seeing the one who's living inside of me now. Hallelujah. It's not saying that you're Jesus. It's not saying that you're someone's. But no, no, you, you're seeing the glory. Because behold, we've got an unveiled face. So beholding as in a mirror now, the glory of the Lord, we've been changed into the same image. We don't see the old man. We don't see Adam anymore. We see Christ. So when you look in the mirror, you don't see the old Adam. You don't see, you don't see the old nature. You don't see Adam. You see the second Adam. You see Christ. And you're being changed into the same, transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit is changing you from within. This is the new covenant where you're different now. You're transformed by the anointing, by the Spirit of God coming to live inside of you. The Holy Ghost is the answer. When you've received Jesus, then he wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that you can begin the process of being changed, transformed, having the law written on your hearts. And that's actually the reality of the new covenant. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so the, old, the, the children of Israel came into that old covenant at Sinai when the law was given. We come into the new covenant when we receive the Holy Spirit and the law is written on our hearts. And we begin to speak with new tongues. We begin to have a whole new life. And we begin to see the glory of the one who's living inside of us. And we're being changed into the same image from glory to glory. So happy Pentecost Sunday next week. Hallelujah. We're coming into Pentecost. We're coming into the fulfillment of Pentecost, which is being filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can walk into the glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen.